Good afternoon, everyone. A great pleasure, first of all, for being part of the session. And uh, I would like to say the huge thank you for the organizers for making this happen. And basically, uh, we got the great speakers today, and I would like to present Mr. Walla Mebanoide, the head of the FinTech division in the National Bank of Georgia. And also, we got Robin Butler, he's a partner and the head of the Stadium Capital. We also got the niche uh, co-teacher. I'm not quite sure the how the right influence is, but anyway, we the co-founder and the chairman of the Footboot, and also the Tonike Asetiani. He's a co-founder and CEO. Uh, it's Edomintos. And last but not least, we got also Salon Nijanashvili from, um, she's a global marketing director. Okay, so let me start from, from Warlam. Um, yes, uh, he will bring us thoughts about the Georgia's fintech and open finance strategies and uh, our plans to a data economy. This is Procios. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, this event and for the panel. Uh, so the name of the panel is uh, Cooperation Opportunities Between Georgia and British Fintech Communities. So we are already quite tight, I think, because uh, our two major banks are already presented. Uh, it's London Stock Exchange, which is more than 80% of the banking already. Uh, so in terms of, uh, I forgot for introduction of myself. My name is Varan Banuiz and I lead FinTech uh, the, uh, Development Department at the National Bank of Georgia. Uh, so, even title of fintech development department, it's quite strange for regulator, but times are changing and we are trying to be uh, as innovative driven as possible. Uh, our fintech strategy is um, uh, uh, very open uh, policy oriented because while defining fintech strategy, we ask, uh, key question to ourselves, what is our unique resources and capabilities which country has to build on some uh, fintech strategy? And uh, the answer was quite obvious. We uh, cannot be market driven because uh, of, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, small uh, market size, 3.5 million people only. And we cannot be uh, cannot count on kind of uh, demographic powers, and our strategy is to be as open policy oriented as uh, possible, and then to build on this some real stuff things. So uh, this is our strategic thinking as a regulator, and as a regulator, we think that we should kind of create baseline uh, for fintech in the country to translate this slogan of be open regulation driven to the real stuff for us means to establish open banking, um, open banking infrastructure for uh, fintechs and new entrants to have uh, uh, EKYC platform, for example, for new entrants. And uh, even for CBDC, we are looking as ecosystem enabler. So this is our thinking uh, process towards this, and it is kind of connected with the UK's open banking strategy as well. Uh, because uh, I have already mentioned during Brian's presentation that uh, their open banking uh, model is uh, kind of role model for us because of uh, success they already achieved. And uh, it is considering to be kind of app store for uh, for banking and already almost 10% um, of population using open banking in the UK. So in this sense, uh, we are trying to develop a uh, uh, business model of our open banking similar to uh, the UK. Uh, in general, I think uh, it's a time then uh, uh, every country should kind of reassess 
the SS, they are financial industry in, in so-called uh, uh, in format of um, uh, Mike Porter's five forces. So what we are seeing is that uh, barriers are being disrupted by technology. Uh, five, 10 years ago, if you would like to start banking business, the first thing you would do is go to the uh, server store and buy the, uh, buy the physical servers. And next thing you would start literally will be with the building business, buy rent uh, the building or uh, start uh, the construction business. So nobody now needs to do this because Amazon Web Services has disrupted this barrier within this uh, Mike Fortes Five Forces framework, but some barriers still exist like uh, data barrier uh, and uh, banking business models only can be developed on uh, basis of um, uh, uh, data experimentation. So we are trying to follow as a regulator this uh, uh, trend of barriers disruption and do even more. And the open banking and then open finance is the uh, is the is, are the tools which we are considering uh, as uh, enablers for startups. Uh, in UK, uh, they have strategy from open banking to build uh, to build uh, data economy through open finance. Open finance meets cross data sharing uh, between um, between uh, different industries, then finance industry sharing data uh, to other industries. So in that sense, we have similar strategy as well. And, uh, uh, and uh, So, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of neo banks as well, like uh, uh, our presenters already mentioned um, the, the great examples of uh, neo banks such as Starling Bank or Revolut Bank. Uh, we are uh, doing uh, some additional uh, tools within uh, the National Bank of Georgia, like regulation sandbox to make easier uh, for uh, neobank applicants to enter into this uh, business. So for example, for, um, uh, for uh, digital banking, we have uh, 10 times less requirement for the capital to start uh, digital banks. Uh, every product and business model goes through, um, uh, through this regulation sandbox and uh, the design of the regulation sandbox uh, at National Bank of Georgia is pretty similar as in the UK. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, what we are seeing, uh, uh, how neobanks are expanding uh, from the UK, uh, they are quite agile, but they have different paths uh, of expansion. Uh, for example, Revolut choose a uh, worldwide expansion path. Uh, and uh, Starling Bank uh, now uh, refocus from B2B to B2C business model. These are very good examples for Georgia because uh, one strategic direction for us is to position kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, hub within the region because uh, uh, the uh, infrastructure enablers I have mentioned like open banking, uh, EKYC platform or CBDC in terms of this in infrastructure enables. If you, we look around, we are quite well positioned uh, 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 compared to our neighbors. So we are thinking about uh, to capitalize on this, for example, to invite through our regulation sandbox startups from the neighbor countries like Armenia, Azerbaijan, and give them platform for experimentation or to exchange ideas with the regulators there. Because uh, we did uh, open banking and onboarded all banks uh, in record uh, uh, time frame in one year, and which is good example for Azerbaijan, for example, they have plans to implement open banking uh, uh, for five years. 
and we are talking with them now to exchange this experience and maybe we will be able to help them decrease this five-year plan to two years for example or we are talking about specific things with um, uh, with uh, our Armenian counterparties uh, about uh, QR code payments, for example, because they and us uh, are developing uh, similar QR payment standards within the countries, and it will be kind of easy to switch both of them uh, on cross uh, country um, uh, payment system, which will be very good for different industries, for example, for the tourism. To conclude, uh, we have chosen a very similar regulatory strategy as UK and as EU overall. When it comes for open banking, for example, we are using PSD2 strategy and we are following Berlin Group's technical standards. But simultaneously, we are staying, uh, staying as agile as possible uh, and borrowing some things from uh, Southeast Asia because the QR payments are, uh, are uh, examples from Southeast Asia. So uh, fortunately or, not, or unfortunately, we are not part of the EU uh, so far, but we, this gives us uh, some regulatory agility. Uh, because we don't need consensus to uh, within the 28 countries. So this is our strategy to identify best use cases for businesses, for consumers, uh, to contextualize it because, uh, for example, financial inclusion, it's not our key priority because 99% of our retail consumers already has uh, uh, cards. But when it comes to SME lending, we still have some gaps and we need to digitize SME lending. So uh, that's why we are identifying this kind of use cases, which are already built uh, within the UK's open banking ecosystem. And we have exactly similar data points here in the open banking. So it's kind of example for our um, startup community uh, to start capitalizing. And we are uh, borrowing good things, as I mentioned, from Azure. And uh, so we are using this uh, 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 these uh, trends and tools uh, to position again ourselves as a fintech hub within the region, as well as to uh, cooperate, for example, uh, with the uh, JITA Startup Accelerator as a regulatory sandbox uh, 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 within the National Bank of Georgia and kind of to uh, join forces because uh, many of startups coming from JITA's FinTech Accelerator are FinTech focused startups. So it's quite natural to join forces. So it's kind of multidisciplinary engagement in our strategy. And this builds uh, the second strategic direction uh, for us, which is kind of Estonian model to incumbent the startups, which have potential to scale abroad then. So two directions, position as a FinTech hub, and also to adapt the startups uh, from the country or within the startup community based on our fintech structure enablers, uh, the startups which are scalable uh, for uh, foreign markets. Great, thank you. Thank you. Just, you, you mentioned that the situation we had at the back in, for instance, in 2010, um, when the financial technology itself does not exist at all, am I right? So talking about the Georgian perspectivity, so for instance, the last 10 years, so we developed a lot in terms of the internet banking. And I had a chance to talk with Tonic about the, for instance, situation in the UK or in US, how it works and how the hardest is to, I mean, the, uh, the, the roadmap over internet banking. And also uh, if you look at the situation in terms of the contactless payments in Georgia, so. The, the situation we got right now and the back in uh, 2010. So we had a huge development. Well, from your perspective, so what are the, the, the challenges and, and, the, and then the obstacles uh, from regulatory point of view, and as well as from the commercial perspective. 
So what is the our roadmap? And also, as you mentioned, the, we are the part, we are not actually the, you know, the full uh, capacity part of the EU requirements, but at some point it has to be uh, influenced to us as well. So what is the roadmap and how we see the perspectives in the stake? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so I'm going to say something uh, provocative from regulatory perspective. Bill Gates has predicted 20 years ago, banking is necessary, banks are not. So we are seeing already this trend here and future is here. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we are supporting this trend. And uh, our focus is, our final destination is uh, open finance. This uh, thing could be achieved through different uh, tools. One is PSD to open banking protocol. The another one is embedded finance. And we are seeing already embedded finance use cases in Georgia. Then banks or other platforms are embedding their uh, APIs within the <clears throat> platforms. Uh, and uh, we uh, are trying to capitalize both of them and support as we can. Uh, our uh, key objective is to support good use cases for society. And by which means we achieve this by open banking or embedded finance, it, it doesn't matter. For example, uh, Embedded finance uh, where uh, in the US was always market driven. And their results speak themselves. Uh, uh, more than 50% of uh, all payments are done through embedded APIs uh, by merchants in the US. In the uh, EU, this number is uh, around 10%. Uh, this, uh, uh, despite the thing that PSD2 is great thing. PSD2 is great case and example of regulatory driven uh, uh, innovation. But we see numbers and statistics in the US, it's already more than 50%. In the EU is 10%. In the UK is uh, about 20%. So I mentioned that fortunately or unfortunately we are not part of the EU so far. So we have this uh, agility to uh, move forward uh, by different directions uh, and to support any uh, use case which kind of big brings public goods. So for example, uh, uh, Basel uh, Banking Group uh, differentiates <clears throat> defines uh, uh, open banking and CBDC as a public good. It should be accessible for everyone. So our objective is to support this kind of use cases by all means to motivate startups, to motivate other participants of the market, to explain them. And we are now planning second phase of the open banking because uh, 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 one week ago, our parliament finally approved PSD2 legislation, which gives uh, uh, already opportunity for non-banks to join the open banking infrastructure. It was connected to the uh, SEPA application, which is single euro payment area. And that means that uh, by entering into single euro payment area, we will become a uh, kind of community where Euro payments are done almost instantly within the EU and uh, still UK is part of this uh, single uh, Euro payment area besides, uh, besides Brexit. So uh, this would be a kind of example of the uh, uh, movement towards open banking uh, financial infrastructure. But uh, already uh, I mentioned that we are borrowing some technologies from even Southeast Asia, which is QR code payments, and uh, trying to uh, move forward simultaneously. Uh, we are starting now meeting uh, different uh, communities uh, to explain benefits of uh, open banking and to convince them uh, to join open finance movement. For example, we have already scheduled meeting with the Cheetah startup community, 
uh, there is a pre preliminary preliminary um, negotiations and promising negotiations with the insurance uh, market regulator that they want also to join uh, open banking, um, but no specifics yet, but we are talking with them. Uh, currency exchanges, cash currency exchanges uh, could be part of the open banking uh, soon. So this kind of real stuff things uh, based on EU practice, based on UK practice, based on Indonesian or Singaporean practice. Great, very, very promising speech from our alum. So we got any questions from the audience and otherwise we will move to the next speaker. And Um, uh, you mentioned that we are not like member of European Union, unfortunately. Uh, I'm interested, especially what will be changed if the Georgian will join the European Union uh, and if it can be a game changer in this case. If it will be a game changer in this case, if Georgia will join the European Union. I'm not sure it will be game changing in terms of fintech, uh, but it uh, comes with uh, some benefits, certainly. I already mentioned the uh, SEPA, which is single euro payment area. We are uh, becoming part, uh, uh, even without being a uh, member of the EU of this uh, network. This kind of benefits. Another benefit we could expect from being part of the EU is uh, so called um, cross. Uh, country regulatory sandbox which is passporting rights for uh, startups there so for example uh, it is well known that uh, british uh, neo banks like uk hold banking license from uh, lidwa or other baltic state countries because if you have a just one uh, country like banking license, you could uh, enter to other countries uh, within the EU. And uh, this is huge opportunity for startups, of course, and regulatory start, uh, supports this kind of uh, uh, markets within the EU. Uh, and uh, yes, it opens uh, 500 million uh, markets for Georgian startups. Uh, you know, from this kind of uh, tools perspective, like passporting and cross-country regulation sandbox, uh, single payment area, or uh, there are already talks about PSD3, which is extension of PSD2. And the, one of the uh, key promise, which PSD3 is bringing is uh, cross-country use cases. So uh, most of the EU countries, they have uh, Berlin Group protocols implemented. So it, it is uh, very easy now to start, um, start uh, uh, integrating and find interoperability between different countries' open banking uh, systems within the EU. Uh, and this, in this context, we are well positioned because we initially started uh, our own open banking infrastructure based on PSD2 uh, protocol, and uh, it will be much easier for us when we will become uh, part of the EU to start speaking with the other countries' open banking uh, infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you, Alon. So we, we are strictly required to feed within with the timeline. So next speakers, but any questions? Thank you. Uh, I was wondering uh, for FinTech companies, when will PSD2 be available, be available on the production, I mean, the real environment, because uh, as AZ, we are kind of eager to implement it as fast as possible. So. Do you have any like clarity on the timeline or is it still like ambivalent and it's about 2023? 
So if, if I understand the question correctly, uh, the accelerator thing, right, for startups. Ah, it's, it's already available. Uh, yeah, uh, it's already available for startups. Uh, Parliament approved the legislation and it enters into force uh, from November 1. There are already free protocols built in open banking. Uh, one payment initiation, then another one uh, data aggregation and already is uh, EKYC within this. All banks, we are kind of uh, required to open up these APIs and it's there. So I would encourage every non-banks and startups to uh, start experimentalizing as soon as possible. Thank you. Then we got the next speaker, Robbins. So he's uh, the partner ahead of the impact surging capital. So stage is yours. Everyone hear me okay? Um, thanks so much for uh, still being here. I appreciate it. it's getting getting late in the day. Um, I'm Robin, uh, as, as introduced, one of the partners and the head of impact at, at Sturgeon Capital. Uh, we're a London-based VC investing across Central Asia, as well as Egypt, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, we focus on early stage startups uh, in fintech, B2B software, and marketplaces. Uh, today, we have 16 portfolio companies, uh, including Paisy in Georgia, as well as companies in Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Egypt, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and out of the UAE as well. Um, if we go back a little bit, um, and I would kind of want to talk about fintech here, but uh, Sturgeon Capital has actually been around for 16, 17 years, and um, we were one of some of the earliest uh, international investors in TBC and uh, Bank of Georgia uh, before they were before they were listed in um, uh, listed in the UK. Uh, we were also investors in Liberty Bank, so we've seen, if you like, uh, the traditional uh, financial sector and invested in it and. Uh, did, did very well out of it um, at, at the time uh, by being early. Uh, and I think that kind of history within the tra traditional financial uh, services space is really the kind of foundation on which Georgia can build uh, a reputation uh, and gain market share across both, both uh, Central Asia and the, the former Soviet Union, as well as uh, further afield. Those kind of core skills, I think really a, a mindset that is uh, much further ahead than a lot of other countries in the region in terms of openness to uh, new opportunities. We're hearing about the regulator uh, and their attitude to fintech and and really being uh, cooperative uh, as much as they can with with startups and, and new ideas, uh, new opportunities. That that is not the norm for most of the markets that we invest in. Generally, the regulator tends to be afraid of fintechs uh, and anyone who wants to do anything differently. Um, so that gives, gives uh, I think, gives Georgia uh, a very strong position. Um, when we when we think about fintechs, we kind of break it down into into two buckets. Uh, on the one hand, you have the infrastructure fintechs. So so companies such as Paysy that are building that that back end infrastructure that enables the B two C and B two B lending and other services uh, that you do on the front end. Um, then the other aspect of what we look at is is uh, is that uh, fin fintech lending startups. Um, it, it, I think for for, for Georgia. Um, in that kind of regional as, as well as global presence, uh, opportunities such as Bayesian, we're investors. So of course, I'm going to uh, uh, just to kind of caveat that when I uh, sing 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 their praises. Um, but that sort of infrastructure using the the talent base, both uh, when it comes to software development uh, and in the IT sphere, as well as the experience within financial services, to build products and solutions and services that can be scaled outside of Georgia and across the region, because ultimately. Georgia as, as a market, three and a half million people and and the financial sector dominated by by, by two banks already. Uh, it's unlikely probably for a, for a neo bank uh, to be successful just in just just in Georgia or a fintech to be su truly successful just in Georgia. Um, but to use uh, the the connections, whether it's uh, sort of uh, cultural and, and and historic with with the region or, or, or further afield, looking at the UK um, or other European markets, uh, that's that that's where I see the opportunity on that uh, on that infrastructure side. Um, I can go on talking more about uh, how we invest in fintechs, but I think it's probably more interesting if people actually have questions um, about what we do or uh, or that side of things. So I'll so I'll stop there. 
Any questions from the audience? Thanks, Robin. Um, do you mind giving us a case example of someone that you've invested in a fintech company? Maybe what went well, what went bad? Any advice for people here about how to unlock money? Um, I mean, I suppose I, uh, if I can give the the, the PayZ example, or I can, uh, as we kind of heard uh, heard from the guys already, I can I can speak about. Uh, I'll, I'll speak about PayZ, and I'll speak about another uh, PayZ. I guess. Um, when it came to, to raising money, had had the advantage of of having been through uh, been through Y Combinator, which gives a kind of uh, a more of a global uh, platform um, to to get in front of investors. Y Combinator's track record, particularly in the space that that is operating in, having been uh, having incubated Stripe back in the day, uh, any Stripe um, type company that's been through. Y Combinator has been successful in, in raising money and uh, most of them have then gone on to be su su successful elsewhere. Um, but if we kind of actually break it down to what, what it was about PayZ that for us, because Y Combinator is a, a good signal, but it's not the only reason to invest, at least not, not, not for us, is looking, I think, particularly at the team and the experience that they had. Um, so in both Geiger and Kaha, you have two individuals who are very experienced within the kind of financial services space, uh, Kaha in particular with a kind of track record of building products and, and solutions uh, across across the, across financial services, both in the public and, and the private sector. That really kind of deep industry expertise as an investor is very uh, is very appealing. Um, it, it makes it always makes us a bit nervous if we look at a founding team and uh, they may they may have a lot of skills, but if they have no direct experience of the market that they that they want to operate in, the well, question is, well, how are you going to know whether you're doing the right sort of thing? Whereas someone uh, like 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 the PayZ team, and I think you then look at who they've hired as well beneath that, it really is that sort of kind of stellar lineup of individuals who have experience across across financial services, um, and then you've seen how they've uh, how they've uh, it's been a pleasure working with them since then uh, as they've as they've entered Uzbekistan uh, and also entering Kazakhstan as well. Um, for us, I think we're, we're part of the reason we invested as well is that they target the markets that we're active investors in. We know well, and I like to think we can provide support. We were chatting earlier about um, a connection with one of the banks that they're uh, looking to work with in Uzbekistan. So, so for us, yeah, that kind of founding team is 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 uh, is really important. Um, do they have the right kind of experience? And certainly in Paisley's case, uh, that was true. Okay. Any any further questions? Okay, Robbie, just just a generic, you know, the question: Why why the the beneficial using the AI in terms of the financial tech solutions? And the another one: the is it still the the COVID nineteen uh, affected or affecting uh, the the you know the financial technology solutions, or how is affecting? Sure. Um. So on the the first question, I think. Um, we see a lot of uh, startup presentations that have some kind of, they mention AI or ML or whatever, and actually they're not really doing anything that's particularly intelligent. Um, it's it's kind of putting it up as a tagline because investors want to see it. And so startups put it there and it gets attention, which I understand, like you, you, you want to raise money. But I think particularly across um, a lot of the markets that we invest, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Georgia is probably the most developed in terms of, it almost certainly is in terms of financial services of, of the markets that we invest in. But we look at a lot of others and you, you don't need to go down the AI route to be making kind of 10x, 20x improvements in terms of how people, uh, businesses and consumers do business. Um, and I think you can also potentially kind of over engineer something for these sort of markets. I think if you're operating in, in the UK or uh, in more developed markets and you're looking to really uh, have have an edge and deliver significant value rather than just marginal and incremental returns in terms of quality. Then then yes, going down that route. But I still think a lot of a lot of startups that 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 mention that are doing it more because they think that investors want want to hear that um, and don't actually really have uh, don't really differentiate themselves because they have genuine AI at the core of what they do. Um, in terms of the kind of the impact of of, of COVID nineteen. Uh, Certainly in the markets where we invest, predominantly cash-based economies, 
there has been a significant increase in digital payments. Um, that is at the same time as kind of central banks uh, and regulators are pushing the traditional financial institutions as well as fintechs to cater more to consumers, um, having historically tended to just lend to large corporates where they could generate nice returns or lend to the government uh, and be pretty happy with that. So you've had kind of, I think, a dual, dual uh, two, two factors, one being the kind of reg regulatory um, push to, to provide more services to consumers, the other being COVID-19, pushing more, uh, uh, increasing the penetration of e-commerce where digital payments is more important, although you still have a lot of cash on delivery. Um, and then also digital payments in store, uh, whether that's contactless or the use of QR codes. Um, I think what you're seeing as well is that kind of leapfrogging for countries that are predominantly cash-based, they're not going through the sort of step-by-step -step, uh, POS system that maybe we have in uh, the UK or in developed markets. It's skipping straight ahead to, to using uh, QR codes or payment through, um, uh, I don't know, you take a country like Pakistan and they've launched the RAST system, which is like the UPI one in India. Um, so really trying to uh, open, open up financial services to as many people as possible without having maybe some of that legacy infrastructure uh, being installed and uh, used as well. Thank you, Robin, for giving the insightful information. Thanks much. The next we got the Nish, and uh, he's going to join with the Zoom. Hi, can you see me? I don't know if you have video there, but I'm on video, so there you go. Um, very nice to uh, be on the panel. Thank you uh, to um, the DIT for inviting me to join. I'm based in London, um, and you're being beamed directly from my home office. Um, so thank you again uh, for the opportunity. Um, let me start by giving a little bit of background on me because I wear, wear a number of hats, uh, all linked in some way to fintech. Um, I started life in investment banking. Um, I was at B Barclays Investment Bank, JP Morgan and Lehman. Um, and then for the last 20 years, I've been an entrepreneur. Um, and my second startup, I built a retail agent bank uh, focused at the bottom of the pyramid in India from an idea to 25 million customers and 14,000 branches um, using technology and old banking techniques. We were a regulated uh, organization and uh, as a key point, I'm a strong believer in regulation for banking uh, services. Um, recently, I started a enterprise blockchain business uh, with my partners and we, we work between Cardiff and I know one of you uh, did uh, did your degree at Cardiff University, so well done, what a great place. Our head office is in Cardiff, and we also have a large operation in Barcelona. Um, this is partly as a result of Brexit. So while you're trying to join the EU, Britain is desperately trying to leave it, which is bizarre. Um, and finally, um, I mentor and chair a very innovative uh, fintech uh, business in Bangladesh. Uh, which uses psychometric credit analysis um, to provide a lending platform, and that has now scaled to a much wider um, full-service uh, banking platform. So I'm going to stop there. Where uh, please look at me on online. Um, you're speaking about a topic that's very close to my heart. So the opportunity for UK Georgia fintech. To me, it's all about the word that Robin used in his earlier uh, talk. Um, which was about leapfrogging. Um, don't copy the UK, uh, jump ahead. And that's the opportunity you have. Um, so here's the opportunity and here are the challenges. 80% of your banking um, is covered by two banks. That's an opportunity to disrupt. Um, the way I think FinTech should operate is in partnership with banks and regulated entities because FinTechs, uh, to raise their own capital and balance sheet structure um, and comply with regulation. As I said, I'm a big believer in regulated banking entities, um, is too expensive. Um, there have been many fintechs who have launched without such um, uh, approvals and, and, uh, and um, licenses, and they will gradually become unstuck. Um, so I think the opportunity is to work in partnership with um, existing banking infrastructure and provide the innovation that they themselves are challenged to do. 
um, I heard the previous speaker and uh, and it's great, but I'm yet to find a, you know, a legacy bank that can disrupt its own business model um, because they'll always have an eye on the existing cost and infrastructure that they have to provide for. So the new startups can really provide a different flavor. I'll give you one example of a fintech that I'm uh, working with in Bangladesh. Um, it's very interesting, it's partnered with the largest commercial bank in Bangladesh called Prime, and they brought in an innovative technology um, team led by an amazing, amazing woman um, who has taken fresh ideas for her generation and the way that they want to see and access banking products. And this spans from credit through to payments, to insurance and to um, and to savings. So um, uh, look at the whole scope um, of, uh, of the product range, not just a credit product. And the reason why many start at the credit side is because it's the most profitable. Right. But if we can change credit and put it on a smartphone, which is what this startup has done, it's called a GAM. Please have a look. Um, you can also change savings, also change the way we do payments. Um, these don't need to be separate organizations. The point is that once you're integrated with a platform into a bank, the integration is the hard part. Getting through the security layers within a bank is the hard part. Getting their approval is the hard part. Building functionality on the same on the same platform once it's integrated is actually straightforward and where the innovation can really play. Um, I want to come on to a different area. Uh, the first speaker mentioned it, EKYC. Why are you doing EKYC on existing technology? Why not use blockchain? The point here is why not leapfrog? Because once you've created that digital passport, um, and you've stored it in a, in a blockchain environment. It doesn't need to be a public blockchain. I'm talking private permission blockchain networks. Look at what JP Morgan is doing with their uh, JPIN uh, network, where they have 400 banks now on board. Much easier to share the KYC and almost offer an alternative, a full alternative to SWIFT that is real time. So coming back, leapfrogging, working with the existing banks and creating alternative product opportunities that even the existing banks can't do. They know they want to, but they can't. So partner with them and leapfrog even beyond the UK because you have the benefit of 3.5 million people. You have absolutely, what, 65% in the right age group, and they are consuming banking and financial services, including insurance in a different way to certainly my generation. I'll stop there. Thanks much, Nish. Just a quick question from my side. The, what are the, some of the challenges the bank face when uh, they are implementing an AI strategy? And how uh, can they overcome them? And what are the challenge the, in 2022 and beyond the, you know, the 2025 strategy. So what are you seeing on this? Absolutely. Look, the hardest, the hardest part to work with an existing bank is the, um, you know, their mindset is thinking about creating value for their existing infrastructure. So, so they price product. They, they, you know, look at a business model with covering their costs. The challenge is to, when they wake up and realize that actually a lot of those costs may not be um, required for the business model of the future. And that starts to change completely the economics. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, in Bangladesh, when we were working with, um, with Prime, who I have to say have been terrific, albeit it's taken a long time, and it's required a lot of mm. eureka moments um, within their organization. Um, this was the first time that they automated the credit lending decision. So then you have a team of credit analysts and a team who are completely responsible for, for authorizing credit in an analog way. What happens to them? How much of a roadblock are they? So you need to work 
with the bank right at the top, because once you start to automate, if the top are brought, brought into to the proposition, it can start to change the complete flavor of the bank and the way that they deliver their services. So that's the challenge. It's navigating people, but it's then also navigating legacy technology. Not easy. I mean, it's the second time I've done this in, in those types of markets. It is not easy. OK, but if you can get to that end goal where you've got your first product running on a platform, then it gets very exciting uh, as to what the future could look like. And, uh, and that's exactly where we are. So the, the next few years for us in Bangladesh, hugely exciting. Thank you. Anybody from the audience? Here we go. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, that's really great. I find that uh, you're um, kind of bringing to the mass uh, this blockchain technology. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm really wondering, so I just came across your company just briefly while reading that you're um, uh, developing this platform Marco that is blockchain based. It's really great. And also I find really great uh, blockchain because it's give the power, it's take the power from middle band and give the power to, to the cloud, to the actual end users who can kind of operate the network. I was just wondering, I didn't find uh, on which block, blockchain or networks operates uh, your platform. I was really curious about it. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent question. And, and certainly thank you for taking the opportunity to research FinBoot, which is um, uh, an enterprise blockchain business. So I, I, will, um, I will not give you a short answer. When we set up in 2016, one of the big problems we identified is the challenge of which blockchain. Um, and in our thesis, we do not believe there will be one blockchain that will capture the market. So, um, and then as you know, there are two big groups of blockchains. There's the public version and there's the private or permissioned blockchain version. And both of those will have blockchain languages, which will solve certain problems. Bitcoin is very good for moving money, albeit very slow. Ethereum is now becoming very good, with certainly with its new changes, uh, which happened on the 15th of September. Um, Ripple and so on in the public world. In the private permissioned world, those are simply languages. They each have benefits and drawbacks depending on the application. So we wanted to build a, a platform that was agnostic to which blockchain uh, was required to solve a particular uh, problem or address a particular pain point. So the answer to your question is we work with them all. Um, it's a plug and play. Um, so we have applications that are built on Marco that use Ethereum, but then also use Hyperledger, that also use Coda, but also use Quorum. So, uh, when a client says to ask, which blockchain are you using? Our response is, which one would you like? Now, the big benefit of that is going forward, because this is a future looking conference, we don't know which one will be a winner, and nor do we know whether we are yet to have a new blockchain technology developed by someone that is even better than what we've seen. And we wanted to be able to give our customers the benefit of that. So in our case, something new comes tomorrow, we can plug it into the back of Marco and it operates as it's done before with those benefits. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass the mic to Tony Kiss, so please what you got. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting us, first of all. Um, I will try to divert the discussion towards the uh, bridge that is being built between Georgia and UK. And uh, I myself am a co-founder and CEO of a British-based company called EduMentors. We're also a tech startup. And what we're currently doing is harnessing the power of Georgian talent because we have so much talent trapped in this country. And because we're not, unfortunately not a member of EU and um, because uh, not too many countries know about the existence of, of, of us, uh, our talents are not being hired that frequently in the uh, foreign countries. So Edumentors, is what, what we're really doing is we're uh, hiring most of our team here in Georgia. And this way we are trying to bring 
informational capital or try to develop the entire startup ecosystem in uh, Georgia and um, have our, our contribution in this. And I think that fintech is definitely one of the most important uh, sectors in the UK because um, the, the UK is actually called as a the, the London itself, the city is called the capital of the world in terms of finance and the, the amount of capital that moves there on a daily basis might be even more than the GDP of a country. Um, and um, it's very nice to hear that they are seen as a role models for, for Georgia and that we're following some of the, the roadmaps. But at the same time, I would like to mention that um, there are some advantages of being a small a small country and not having this inherent legacy software that all the banks and companies in the UK have. The reason why Georgian fintech is so agile probably is also because we didn't have to inherit all this uh, code that is now outdated and is clunky and is difficult to work with. And at some point in, in the history, Georgia has just rewrote the, the complete uh, infrastructure from scratch uh, bring in mind the the best practices, and this is this is why the uh, ecosystem in Georgia is uh, developing so well. And as a as a company who's um, providing the service to many countries, because Edge Mentors now has customers in eleven countries, I completely agree that the fintech is an absolute enabler of the startup ecosystem. And the reason for this is that in order for any for profit business to exist. They need to get um, some revenue, right? And the people or the businesses have to pay them. And unfortunately, these banking systems um, have been known that they're, they're difficult to use. Sometimes the transactions could take ages before it arrives the final destination. Whereas fintechs are actually changing this very much. Um, right now, I could have a customer in, in Bangladesh or Pakistan or Egypt, and we actually do have customers from some of those countries. And just with the use of Stripe, which is uh, an international payment provider company, we are able to accept payments from all these countries without a friction. So this is why a FinTech has a huge role in the development of uh, all the startups. And um, I know that uh, PayZ also is uh, trying to disrupt the same uh, in, in this local market, as well as in other uh, post-Soviet countries. And I hope to see more and more startups coming up out of the uh, this small country. And um, I also hope that our contribution into the development of the tech talents, the development of the capital, the exposure of Georgian fintech or other tech startups to the global world would increase. And um, I'd also like to, to mention a couple of things from my personal perspective, not only from the, from the company's perspective. Um, I've been living in, in the UK for quite a while and I have been using different banks and including those meal banks. Uh, and um, one is that obviously most of the students, most of the youngsters in these countries prefer to have these neo banks because of their flexibility, because of their agility and so on. But another thing that they, they also like is that the user experience, the user interface, the usability of these platforms are much better and customized to the end customer's needs. And what I see as a huge advantage of Georgia is that we are agile in a way that we can adapt to all the global changes. Just to give an example, the first time open banking was mentioned in the Georgian system was several years ago, way, way later than it was being uh, undertaken and operated in the UK. But we already see some implementations and real life examples, right? We can see Bank of Georgia offering to see the accounts in their app of other banks. And there are many more implementations that we see. And uh, the regulatory part also is something that enables such uh, agility. And I'm very happy that uh, Georgia has um, a regulation part that in some sense is communicating with the startups and trying to um, facilitate the development of um, the uh, startup and tech ecosystem. One of the biggest um, advantages of Georgia is also to have uh, agencies like JITA, which we are officially thankful for because we also won their grants and they plant the seed for a lot of Georgian startups. And now I, I, I was uh, talking to some of my friends here in the room and I've heard that there are so many new fintech startups coming up that we can be, we can bridge this gap between 
uh, Georgian capital and the UK capital even farther because all these companies can build something much quicker, much stronger with uh, less um, regulations uh, while we still can before we enter the EU. And this could help us to build some real tangible products that could change not only the infrastructure of Georgia, but also change the infrastructure of the other countries. Hopefully at some point the UK as well, uh, because um, it has proven many times that uh, no, no lobbying or no legacy uh, in heritage would uh, hinder the development of the startups and the innovation, because innovation always finds the way out and finds the way to uh, improve the lives of, of people. I also heard that uh, there are, in for example, the, the crypto uh, world, which is also something new to the entire, the, the entire uh, world, is that in Georgia only we have I think up to 10 uh, exchange platforms, right? Which is something really impressive in such a short amount of time. And this is probably partially because of the um, lighter regulations, even though we follow the guidelines of the EU, but also because of the openness and the, the culture of uh, agility, the culture of entrepreneurship that we have in Georgia. So um, I would really be thankful to any organization that is currently deploying capital in Georgia to Sturgeon for facilitating the development of Georgian startup ecosystem and attracting more and more capital towards these brilliant minds that are now able to build startups and show the world that we can actually create uh, amazing products. So um, probably two or, two or three more things uh, quickly to mention, which we are also very thankful to the UK embassy because um, there are many educational exchange programs which enable Georgian citizens to go to the UK, study there and completely change their career. My co-founder also was accepted with such a scholarship and she completely transitioned her career from um, Georgia to the UK uh, market. And now we're building an, an, an ecosystem there. So uh, thank you to everyone who is hiring Georgian talents because this also gives the, the youngsters more motivation to explore what's new in the, in the market, what's happening in the world. And I think we're on the right trajectory of disrupting the barriers that have been holding countries like ourselves uh, back from adopting new changes. And um, it's nice to see that you know, the, the Georgian banks are now already announcing that they want to build the super apps that will bring much better uh, experience to the users. So overall, um, I think it's nice to be in this country at this time currently, uh, despite this uh, political um, hazards that we have. And I really do have high hopes that uh, the economy will grow and the bridge between Georgia and UK, just because we are agile and we can produce FinTech products would increase further and uh, will have its, its role. And just to probably end with a couple of notes on how it is actually enabling the startups like EduMentors, um, and how fintech is important is we have employees in Georgia, right? And as an, as, a, as an employer, you have to pay them a salary, right? Which is quite difficult and costly if you use traditional banks. Whereas if you use a fintech called uh, WISE, uh, which was previously named uh, TransferWISE, you can transfer the funds directly from the UK to Georgia in a matter of one day. You don't have to wait for a week to, for the money to arrive. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go because these transactions are only one way for now. We can't use WISE to transfer money from Georgia to UK, but I do, do really hope that it happens. So from a startup perspective, we can feel the importance of FinTech and the development. And we do hope that um, the capital, the, the human resource, and the fintech environment in Georgia develops to a, to a way that it also gets some recognition from the global markets. And um, I hope that Edumentors also plays the role in this kind of development. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, all I had to say. We can discuss many other things, so feel free to uh, ask any questions as, an, as a business operating in in the UK and other countries and as a, in the, an individual who has been living there for quite a while and has been in touch with many fintechs as well as traditional banks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. While I'm, you've got some comments, please. Yeah, just, just to react to a couple of points what Tornike said, uh, I completely share with Tornike that uh, our banking sector, uh, sector is uh, a very agile, even compared to the some incumbent banks in the UK. 
and the yeah, one of definitely. one of the reasons for this is that it was not burdened with the legacy system and we start building uh, it uh, only 30 years ago and our major banks are absorbing innovation uh, at rocket speed like big fintechs both of them so this is uh very true and i share this uh, point the another point is that uh, uh yes I share your optimism, Tornike, about the future of entrepreneurship here uh, in Georgia and innovation. And uh, as uh, as our professor from London Business School, we are both the alumni of London Business School, and our marketing professor, uh, professor used to say that uh, the context was innovation. Uh, we Breaching, uh, invented all kinds of sports, but nowadays many nations are beating us in uh, many sports. So innovation is con uh, content process, it's a process, and uh, we are learning a lot uh, from uh, UK, uh, but uh, same time we have this fortune to be agile. And, uh, so we need to capitalize on these opportunities. Thank you, guys. And I, I guess we got the, the cherry on top of the cake. So Salome, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me the chance to be a part of this interesting discussion. Um, my name is Salome Janashvili. I'm Global Marketing Director of Georgian Startup called Knik. And uh, to tell you short about the company. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's so nice. This is Knik. Yeah, this is Knik. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Knik is a Georgian startup. It produces and develops wearable technologies. It was founded back in 2016 in Georgia. Uh, and I have to mention that our products are fully uh, produced in Georgia in our uh, production facility located in Tbilisi. So our main products are uh, bracelets, uh, smart bracelets and smart rings. Um, in 2020, we launched the first Tesla key ring in the world. They became very popular in the market of the United States. So um, uh, to uh, tell you more about the Tesla ring, uh, in case of Asia, for example, our uh, exclusive distributor is Circutech. Circutech is a subsidiary company of Foxconn, world's largest uh, technology provider. And so uh, year after, uh, Knik launched uh, the payment ring, the payment ring, uh, that I wear on my finger. That's a smart ring that enables contactless payments. And to tell you more about how uh, the product works, um, we use a tokenization system. And we have a variety of European banks integrated in our community and network. Our products are fully licensed by Visa and MasterCard. That means that our products are in their network. So, in, in terms of the United Kingdom, we partner, uh, in case of the UK, we partner uh, with a local nail bank, a British nail bank called Cure. So, uh, it's known as Cure Card as well. So, uh, it's a mobile app, a product um, that uh, integrates multiple cards into one payment uh, credit card. So it means that uh, instead of using multiple bank cards, you can use just QR uh, card to like uh, do money transfer, to pay and to withdraw funds. So um, yeah, uh, and as uh, I mentioned, we are um, doing active marketing campaigns in the United Kingdom. We have a variety of banks, uh, uh, and uh, we plan to um, we plan to uh, raise brand awareness in the United Kingdom. Um, yeah. Um, and as well as like, uh, you know, future plans are to uh, develop a luxury smart ring line uh, and uh, like uh, to add more automotive companies in our product line. Thank you. Questions? We got from the audience to Salome or Torniki maybe. I was 
Yeah. Question, uh, sorry, sure. a question for me is uh, you, uh, you mentioned that kind of part, uh, partner strategy when entering new markets. Um, yeah. How do you, when, when, when kind of looking at a new market to think whether to, to go direct and have your own sort of kind of direct marketing and, uh, and team on the ground versus looking, looking for partners? Is it, is it purely partners? Is it a hybrid of both? And if it is, if you do do both, how do you decide between each, between each strategy, depending on the market? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you for a question. Um, for example, in the United States, we have a local, uh, team that works on the US market. And in terms of UK, uh, and in case of UK, we have, a uh, we're partnering with local banks and they are helping us to do local marketing to adapt to local challenges, for example. Uh, and uh, in the future, and currently we are working uh, to expand our team internationally to have um, partners uh, and employees in United Kingdom as well because they work the market the best. That's right. So you mentioned that uh, some of your rinks are already able to pay, make the payments. As one of the earliest adopters, I think I, I bought my first clinic ring when I was still in the university. And I've been working for the, for this feature for a long time. Where where do you have the capabilities of the payment system? Is it, for example, is it uh, possible for for me to pay through a clinic ring in the UK or in some other EU countries? Or what are your operation markets now? Uh, thank you for interesting questions, uh, because I had uh, forgot to mention that uh, our payment function is available currently in the uh, European countries, and uh, the United Kingdom is one of them. Uh, with the um, help of Curve Card, everyone can use Knick Ring in the United Kingdom. So uh, it needs only to um, to have a Curve Card integrated and connected to our ring. And that's it. And in our future plans, uh, it's to expand uh, the payment ring to the uh, market of the United States. But currently, the payment function is available only in Europe. And uh, the European customers uh, can use uh, one single ring, for example, to do payments, contactless payments, and to use uh, the ring as a Tesla key. So we have integrated those two functions into one single ring. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you.